chat with you today. Uh, I want to cover a little bit about sort of the basics of what is crypto, why it matters, and why it fits and how it fits in an investor's portfolio. You know, I, I come from a traditional uh, financial background. Uh, I used to be the CEO of ETF.com, built the first ETF rating system in the world. And when I came into the crypto market, uh, I honestly found it a difficult to navigate sea of buzzwords and poor information. Even basic questions about what crypto really is, uh, why I should care about it, seem like uh, seem difficult to answer in most of the literature. So I've spent a bunch of time trying to simplify it, trying to make it digestible for uh, for regular investors. And I'm going to try to convey what I learned in that today. And, and hopefully it'll make sense. So what I want to cover in this presentation, which will take about 20 minutes, is what is crypto and why it matters, how it fits in a portfolio, and then provide an update on what's happening in 2020. Because obviously this has been a really interesting year with COVID, with the volatility in the market, and with some exciting developments in the crypto space. And so I want to talk about what's happened in 2020 and what it means for the next five years, right? We all know that investing in crypto over the last 10 years would have been a great idea, right? It's up 10 million percent or something over the last 10 years. But what does it mean for the next five years? And so I'll end it there and then and then we can jump into Q&A. Uh, but let's not waste any time. Let's talk about what is crypto and why it matters. Um, and if there's one thing you take away from this presentation, I'd like it to be this. Uh, that crypto is not about a new way to pay for your mocha frappuccino. Uh, the reality is dollars in cash in the U.S. are a great way to pay for mocha frappuccinos. And I think it'll be a long time and maybe never that we use Bitcoin to buy day-to-day -day transactions for consumer goods, uh, buying our daily coffee at Starbucks. If you If you remember one thing from what we're talking about today, it's not a way of paying for coffee. It's a new technological breakthrough that moves money into the internet era. Now that is awfully close to one of those buzzword phrases that I disparaged at the talk, start of this talk. So let me break that down a little bit and make it real because the most important thing to understand about crypto is that it's based on a major computer science technological breakthrough. So. One of the funny things about money, one of the things we don't think about much today is that while much of our lives have migrated into an instant on digital situation, money stays stuck in something like the 1970s or 1980s. And I say this, and I'll give you two examples of what I mean. If I were to go online to my online bank account and pay uh, my cable bill or my water bill, it would take five days before it hits that account. Five days is an eternity in today's day and age. I can, I can open up my cell phone and read any book that's ever existed, watch any movie that's ever uh, been published, have a free video chat call with my friend uh, in Kuala Lumpur. It's like living in the Jetsons age, but in money, it takes five days to pay the internet bill. That's absurd. Another example, if I were to walk to the bank today uh, and tell them I wanted to wire money to someone in, in London, not even a, uh, an emerging market in London, uh, that money couldn't move over the weekends. You know, the, the, the wiring system works nine to five, banker's hours, plays golf on the weekends. Uh, and it would take two to three days to get there. And the fee would be two to maybe four or 5%. That's absurd, right? So what crypto is about is instead of sending money through the old analog system, which I've shown on this chart here on the left, where I tell my bank to send money to you and it has to agree with your bank on the status of my account and it takes multiple days for my check to clear. Crypto is about allowing money to move like emails or text messages where I can send it directly to you and where you'll get it instantly. Now, how does it do this? And I'm gonna spend maybe five minutes on this. I'm not gonna go deep, uh, but, but understanding the, the sort of core science, computer science breakthrough is really critical to understanding why crypto matters uh, and why the people like me who have d decided to focus on it uh, aren't, aren't, aren't crazy in the way some people are portrayed in the press. So let's start here. Why does it take so long for money to move? Well, the answer is it's actually a database problem today. 
So if I send you a check, uh, your bank is not going to allow you to withdraw all the money that's represented from that check until it makes sure that my check clears, right? That I actually have that money in my account, that I haven't written 10 checks on the same deposit, that the status of my account is good. And the process of your bank's database agreeing with my bank's database and clearing through the Fed system takes multiple days. So it's really a database problem, right? And it's not a problem in email. You can have emails move because there's no risk if you open an email and I sent it to multiple people. There's risk for your bank if they let you withdraw the money. So the delay involves one database coming in sync with another database. And I know what some of you are all, all are thinking. We don't need crypto for this. We already have Venmo. Uh, and Venmo is actually a great example of what matters in crypto because Venmo is great. I can Venmo you $100 and you'll receive it instantly, right? The thing about Venmo and the reason it works is that it's a walled garden. You can only send money in Venmo to another Venmo client. So in Venmo, the reason they can move money so quickly is they can see the status of every single account. They control every transaction so that if I send $100 on Venmo to you, Venmo knows that I haven't tried to write that same $100 check, if you want to use that word, on multiple accounts. So for them, moving money is easy as changing an Excel document. The challenge with Venmo is you have to keep your money with Venmo. You can only send money within the Venmo ecosystem. If you want to withdraw money from Venmo, it takes one to three days because you're back in the old analog database structure. So the lesson from Venmo is multiple databases are slow in finance. One database is fast in finance. And the big breakthrough in crypto, the sort of giant computer science leap. And this was something that was identified as a problem in the computer science literature in the 80s uh, by the Stanford Research Institute. People had been working on it for more than 30 years. The designer of Bitcoin, the first blockchain, made this breakthrough and figured out a way to have what's called a decentralized distributed database. And all that means is a database that exists on hundreds of thousands or million computers around the world that's always the same at each of those computers that updates in real time, but where there's no central party that's directing all those copies of the database what to do. So there's no CEO of Bitcoin. Uh, there's there's no uh, sort of employees of Bitcoin. The, the designers figured out a way through computer science and game theory to have one database that's available everywhere that anyone can interact with, uh, but without any centralized party controlling it. So kind of like Venmo, but open instead of closed. Now, that's a lot to tell you like what the core computer science breakthrough is. Let's talk about why that matters. The, the reason it matters, and, and when you think about sort of disruptive technology, you need to think about areas where there is a 10 or 100x improvement over the existing system. The reason it matters is it introduces three exponentially disruptive breakthroughs into the world. So the first is this breakthrough in what's called settlement speed. And just to give you this example, I talked about how if I were to wire money to the UK using the traditional Fed or, or bank wire system, it would take two to three days and the fees would be two to 4% and it wouldn't work over the weekends. By contrast, if you look at Bitcoin, uh, a few months ago, someone sent $1.1 billion in a single Bitcoin transaction. They sent it at night. It settled in 10 minutes and the fee was 57 cents. So let's take a moment just to think about that. You have the largest bank in the world, let's say Bank of America, 200,000 employees, offices in 38 countries, a $4 trillion balance sheet, and it takes them two to three days to wire money, uh, wire $5,000. You have, on the other hand, a unmanaged network with no CEO, no employees, built from the grassroots, no direct oversight, that's able to move $1.1 billion 24 seven and have it settle in 10 minutes for a fee of 57 cents. That is disruptive uh, innovation. And that's just one of the breakthroughs that's enabled. And it's enabled because you have this new database structure that's available anywhere that anyone can participate in, but no one needs to control. The other two, the other, the other two breakthroughs are just as big as that settlement breakthrough. 
Uh, the second one that we like to talk about is the creation of digital scarcity. You know, I have three kids. It's always struck me as odd. Much of their lives are online. But some of the things I remember from my childhood haven't migrated to an online setting. For instance, there's no digital equivalent to a baseball card. And the reason is that prior to the advent of the Bitcoin blockchain, there was no such thing as digital scarcity. And by that, I mean, if, if, if you think about something like, let's say, digital gold, this idea of having digital gold, uh, you can't have a single company controlling the database of who owns what digital gold. If Facebook created something like Zuck Gold and it said, we'll keep a database of who owns what Zuck Gold, no one would deposit their money in Zuck Gold because who knows if Facebook won't create more of that, if it won't steal your money, if it won't be shut down by regulators, if it won't direct it. The reason Bitcoin has emerged as this idea of digital gold is because it's truly scarce. There's only 21 million Bitcoin that will ever exist and you can control it in the same way that you can control or own, let's say a Picasso hanging on my wall. You can have the rights to one of those 21 million Bitcoin or a fraction of those 21 million Bitcoin without any single company uh, blessing that or stamping it with appro approval or providing trust. You can own it as sure as you can own something in the physical world. And this idea of digital scarcity and digital sovereignty is a true game changer. It's why Bitcoin has gone from zero to a $200 billion plus valuation. And the last breakthrough, and I'm almost done, so I appreciate you guys sticking with me to this uh, in-depth explanation of why crypto matters. The last big breakthrough is once you can move money into the internet setting, right? Once it exists online, you can do things with it that you've never been able to do before. Like you cannot program a hundred dollar bill. It's just a dumb piece of paper. But if you move that into a digital setting, all of a sudden you can program it in the same way you can program a computer. So there are lots of things that the traditional finance industry does and charges a lot of money for that are really just if then statements. For instance, an escrow account uh, is really just an if then statement. If one condition happens and another condition happens, cross a given transaction. If I'm say buying a URL, uh, if I, uh, I put the money up to buy that URL and the person who owns it puts the rights up, cross that transaction. Today we pay lawyers thousands of dollars to do just that, to provide trust at the intersection of two parties. Software can do that for effectively free. So once you move money onto the internet, you can program it like you can program any computer and that can bring significant disruption to the financial ecosystem. And when you look at the crypto asset space uh, and you look at say the top three crypto assets, Bitcoin, Ether and XRP, they all are architected in different ways to address these three breakthroughs. For instance, Bitcoin uh, is an exceptionally secure, exceptionally de decentralized crypto asset. As such, it's perfect for serving the digital gold market. And it's the most valuable crypto asset because it's going after a market. This slide says nine trillion. Gold has gone up a lot. That's now a $13 trillion market. It's going after a $13 trillion market. Ethereum is similar to Bitcoin, but it's more programmable. So it's become sort of the, 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 the rails on which people are building a new version of the finance industry. It's allowing money to move in an internet setting. That's a, that's a, some people estimate a 25 or $30 trillion market. Uh, and the third, the third biggest asset, XRP, uh, differs from Bitcoin and Ethereum in that it's optimized for speed. You can actually move money on XRP and have it settle in seconds, right? Bitcoin settles in 10 minutes. Uh, some people think you should wait a while, up to an hour. XRP settles uh, in 10 seconds. Now that idea of replacing money or maybe becoming the tool that people use for international payments is a massive market. It's measured in tens and maybe maybe even a hundred trillion dollars. Um, and there are other crypto assets as well. This is a, a, a slide that shows the year to date returns through the end of August for the 10 crypto assets in the Bitwise 10 index. Bitwise is best known for creating the, the world's first crypto index fund. Uh, institutional investor calls it the S&P 500 of crypto. And you can see that you have very um, 
uh, different returns amongst these 10 assets. You have an asset that's up about 800%. You have a couple other assets that are up hundreds of percent and you have some assets that are up 20 or 30. And the reason they're up different amounts is they're, they're targeting these three different breakthroughs and there's various progress in each of those stages. So uh, this is a very exciting space. Uh, a lot of people ask me, which one of these assets will win? Which is the most important or, or best crypto asset? And the short answer to that is, I don't know. I come from a family that owned a Betamax. I had an AOL account. It's very hard in disruptive technologies to figure out uh, sort of which asset is going to win. What I feel very confident in is that this breakthrough of moving money over the internet is a very big deal. So this is, this is my last sort of introductory slide. If you look at the history of the internet, when the internet launched, all you could do is send files over it. But every once in a while, software programmers come, come through with a new software protocol that lets you to do a new thing. So you may know of STM, SMTP. That's the software protocol that allowed us to send email over the internet. That launched in 1982, and that gave birth to all the email providers, AOL, et cetera. HTTP, which we see at the start of every web page we enter, is just a software protocol that allows us to send linked text and images over the internet. And that gave birth to the modern World Wide Web. For the first 18 years of the internet, you couldn't have the World Wide Web, but we figured it out from a software perspective in, in 89, and that launched a massive industry. SSL, I won't go through all of these, but SSL allowed us to enter encrypted text into the internet. Before 1994, you were told never to put your credit card information into the internet. After 1994, it was safe to do that. That was a software breakthrough that enabled all of internet retail. It's not a coincidence that Amazon was founded in 1994. It couldn't exist in 1993 because there is no commerce over the internet. Bitcoin and blockchain is just the latest in the series of breakthroughs. And what it allows you to do is to move money over the internet. And that's maybe even the most fundamental of these breakthroughs. Money is a very important thing in our world. And so what I have a great deal of confidence in is this ability to move money over the internet, this ability to move a billion dollars in a single click uh, and have it settle in less than 10 minutes with a fee of 57 cents is a fundamental breakthrough. And so uh, at least personally, I want exposure to this breakthrough. Uh, and the reason we, we, we take an index approach is because as I mentioned, it's disruptive technology. You're not sure which particular asset or blend of assets will win. Um, but that's why I think crypto matters. Now, I want to speak for about another uh, five minutes on how crypto fits in a portfolio, because I think this is very important. And then maybe we can we can move into some Q&A. The, the unique thing about crypto in the history of investing is for the for the for the most part, when you have this kind of massive disruptive breakthrough, the only way to get exposure to it as an investor is in sort of top tier early stage venture capital investments, right? So usually you have companies that are building these new disruptive ideas and they're, they're funded by venture capitalists. And if you're a large institution, you can access this. One of the unique things about crypto is it is a uh, an open disruptive technology. So anyone can invest into the crypto space today. Uh, and then that, that leads me to this sort of point, which is that it can be just like early stage venture capital investment that most of us can't be invested in. It can be a, a dramatically powerful tool in a portfolio, a dramatically powerful alternative investment. And, and here's why. The thing about crypto is that it combines three things that are really hard to find. So it combines high potential returns, right? Bitcoin is up 50% this year. Our index is up about 60%. Uh, last year, it was up nearly 100%. Uh, over the past five years, it's up about 3,500%. None of that means it will, it will have those returns in the, in the future, but it has high potential returns and it has low correlations with other assets. So the fundamental drivers, what moves the crypto market are just different from what moves stocks and bonds. Stocks and bonds are driven by economic growth. They're driven by corporate profits. Uh, crypto is driven by education. It's driven by the passage of time. It's driven by technological developments. It's driven by regulatory breakthroughs. 
And as a result, the pattern of returns you get from crypto is just different from what you get from traditional investments like stocks and bonds. This looks at, at the correlation between uh, various crypto assets and the S&P 500 and broad-based bonds and gold. And you can see that the numbers are small, about 0 0.1, 0 0.2. That means that the two assets just move in different ways. Uh, and when you add an asset that has high potential returns and low correlations into a portfolio, you get very interesting results. Uh, so, so here what we've done uh, is we did a study looking at what happened if you added a 2.5% allocation to Bitcoin to a traditional portfolio that's 60% invested in stocks, 40% invested in bonds. And what you see here is the impact is significant. So in the traditional portfolio, the annualized return was 3% over the three year period ending in March of 2020. Uh, if you added a 1% allocation to crypto, the annualized return goes up to 4.6%. The total return jumps from nine to 14%. If you had a two and a half percent allocation to crypto, which is about the average of our clients, uh, the annual return more than doubles. And the, the total return moves from 9% to 22%. And the interesting thing about this is it does this without or it has done this without significantly increasing the risk of the portfolio. Now, Bitcoin itself is very risky. Crypto itself is very risky. It's highly volatile. It goes up and down. It has huge bull and bear markets. But because they're not correlated with stocks and bonds, if you rebalance that allocation, you can have this positive impact without increasing volatility. So you see even at two and a half percent, where you've more than doubled your total return, uh, you haven't impacted the max drawdown, the most the portfolio fell. You haven't impacted the volatility significantly. Uh, and this is what makes it a really unique asset. And I'll, I'll just close with uh, this slide and then, then happy to move into Q&A. Um, if, you, if you look at this, not just on a single snapshot basis as that did, and we have a white paper on this, which you can, you can access through our website if you wanna read deep. Um, but if you look at this over history, there's actually never been a three year period where adding Bitcoin to a portfolio didn't significantly increase uh, the returns of that portfolio. Even if you shorten that to two years or one year, in 96% of two year periods, Bitcoin has increased a portfolio's risk adjusted returns. In 80% or 78% of one year periods, it's increased Bitcoin's uh, a portfolio's risk adjusted returns. This is just a really unique thing that for the most part, investors haven't had access to in the past because they've been locked up in early stage venture capital investments. Crypto is unique in that any investor can gain exposure to it. Uh, and it's at least historically had a very strong impact on portfolios. Now there's, there's a lot more uh, I can talk about here. I could go on about crypto all day. Maybe we'll answer some questions in Q and A, but if I, if I had to leave you with a few thoughts, I would leave you with this. Bitcoin and crypto is not just a new novel currency that someone created on a spreadsheet uh, and that people are eventually going to use at their Starbucks to buy mocha frappuccinos. It's a fundamental technological breakthrough that allows money to move over the Internet. If you want a, a quick way to remember that, just think of that example of wiring money at Bank of America versus moving a billion dollars with the push of a button on an unmanaged network like Bitcoin. Think about one taking two to four days and having two to 4% fees, the other settling in 10 minutes uh, with a fee of 57 cents on a billion dollar transaction. That's a disruptive technological breakthrough. And just like moving mail onto the internet or moving commerce onto the internet or moving media onto the internet fundamentally disrupted those industries and gave birth to tremendous opportunities for wealth creation, moving money onto the internet is a relatively rare uh, and relatively, I would say, significant technological breakthrough. And I think it's gonna have significant ramifications uh, in the years to come. So hopefully that, that gave you a new view on crypto. Uh, happy to, to discuss this more, happy to talk about, you know, what's been going on in 2020 uh, and talk a little bit about how you get exposure to this space. Well, thanks, Matt. I really appreciate that. That was fantastic. I think you did a nice job of breaking down kind of the big picture uh, for cryptocurrencies. Uh, so let me jump first with, with questions I usually get from people, you know, because cryptocurrencies haven't gotten the best 
press, if you will. <laughs> so, I mean, the first thing that a lot of people talk about is they, they've heard of, okay, some people had their crypto stolen. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you kind of address that risk a little bit and, and how that's sort of mitigated? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Uh, and it's absolutely true, both that it's had a lot of sort of negative press and that there is risk of having your crypto assets stolen. If you think back a little bit to the early days of the internet, uh, the early days of the internet also had bad press. Often when you have this disruptive kind of technology, you have both real innovation and then sort of scams and hucksters that come alongside it. So I'm not surprised to see that playing out in crypto. Uh, as, as pertains to people losing their crypto or having uh, their assets stolen, the thing about crypto is um, the way you own a crypto asset is effectively you have a password. Uh, you can think of it like the password to your email account. If someone steals that password, they can steal your crypto. Uh, and what's happened on these, these other exchanges is that they, they secured those passwords in an unsecure fashion uh, and people walked away with it. The good news is over the last three two, three, four years, the situation has significantly improved and the space has uh, institutionalized. Uh, as an example, Bitwise has a Bitcoin fund. It's custodied at Fidelity, right? You now have these blue chip names like Fidelity, like the New York Stock Exchange, allowing you to safely custody your crypto assets. And there are ways to do it extremely safely. These are uh, institutional custodians uh, that are insured, that are regulated by state bank trust charters, that wasn't true a few years ago, but it is true now. It is very important to pick your partner uh, well in the crypto space, because as I said, as a disruptive technology, there are good players in it and less good players. It's important to go uh, with blue chip partners. Uh, so examples of that, uh, you know, we work with Fidelity, we work with Coinbase, the largest company in the space, um, but, it, but it is a, a legitimate thing to keep in mind. Okay, uh, and, and the other thing is, I think people need to get an idea of like how much human ingenuity, how much brain power is going into this. It's almost, uh, you know, everyone knows how Silicon Valley became just an enormous part, uh, you know, influencer when the internet got big, but th there's a lot of software programmers. There's a lot of, you know, IT folks that are now strictly focused on Bitcoin. It's something that's up and coming, but yeah. I mean, do you have any do you have any idea like how and you may not, but like how much how many startups are, are coming in? How many um, techies are, are rolling into it? Is there any data on that? There is data. I don't have it at my fingertips, but I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, it, it's it's the hottest, most attractive area uh, in venture capital in the valley right now. So there are a huge number of crypto specific firms. Um, you know, Andreessen Horowitz is raising its second crypto specific uh, investment fund. Uh, there's a huge boom in venture capital and you're seeing it across all avenues. You're seeing technologists move into the space. You're seeing people from traditional finance move into the space. Uh, you're seeing employment explode into the into the space. Um, it's a very easy market to, to, to find a job right now if you're a crypto expert. So um, I really do think um, I think it's the most single most exciting novel area uh, in venture capital right now. And, and, and you're seeing a, a wave uh, of high caliber people move into the space uh, and a wave of large institutions move into the space. Right? The CEO of Goldman Sachs uh, about a year ago said you have to assume every major financial institution is investigating tokenized payments, which is sort of a uh, industry way of referring to crypto assets. So whether it's the largest firms, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, uh, Fidelity, the New York Stock Exchange, or whether it's this vibrant venture capital ecosystem, uh, it's one of the most exciting areas of, of sort of uh, the technology space that, in, that's happening right now. Okay, it, it, and so the next thing, it's obviously something, like you said, it's innovative, uh, democratizes money, if you will. So you've got a lot of big big power structures that would stand to lose a little bit here obviously the banking sector the brokerage sector but then even the government in, in a way could in effect lose control of be of the money yeah uh, so so a lot of people are kind of worried like all right at some point big government or big business is going to step in and, and squash this and, and what would you say to folks who say that it's a great question uh and and 
And there are people who in crypto who will say that will never happen. I'm a little more realpolitik about it. I think of it by use case. So I talked about those three major disruptive areas, right? Digital scarcity, digital gold, programmable money, and then payments. Uh, digital gold can't be disrupted by governments or institutions because the whole idea is a non-sovereign, non-corporate store of value. And I don't think they feel threatened by Bitcoin as digital gold. So I think that use case is fine. Uh, programmable money in the middle is a debate, right? So the, the question there, I have no doubt that all money is going to move into a blockchain setting. It's just the native uh, sort of technological setting for money. The question is, is it better as, a, as an open source network powered by a blockchain or could a consortium of banks come together uh, and create their own shared blockchain where they control that space? It's a little bit like thinking about is the public internet more powerful than corporate intranets? And I think there'll be a real tussle between those two to see who wins. Uh, in the payment space, uh, that's where there's real competition, right? The Fed doesn't want to give up the dollar being the reserve currency that's used for international payments around the world. Uh, they don't want to forfeit it at control at home. I think what you're going to see there um, is, is banks and central banks, and right now, 80% of central banks are investigating this, uh, creating their own digital currencies. So using blockchain technology to move the dollar into the internet age. China is trying to replace uh, physical currency with a blockchain enabled uh, central bank digital currency before the 2022 Beijing Olympics. Uh, the US is moving forward with the study. 40% of banks are already in the proof of concept phase. So I think you're gonna see that use case um, have, the, have the, the regulators try to disrupt that or co-opt it? Uh, and then the question is, will there be a, a public open version of that alongside? And, and I don't know. Uh, one important thing to keep in mind, and this is uh, a big tension, is that as we just discussed, this is a booming area, right? This is a huge area of disruption. It's a huge area of growth. And so government is acutely aware that they don't want to quash it in the US and have it move offshore. So they're, they've created a sandbox to allow it to grow. Now they're keeping their eye on it, but actually they've been very supportive from a regulatory perspective. So I know that's a nuanced answer. I think it's a nuanced question. I think you'll ultimately see both places um, emerge into the world. Okay. It, yeah, there was a big story just this week. I think it was, you know, why, well, Wyoming's been kind of on the front of trying to set this up, but I think we're starting to see actual crypto banks pop up now. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's moving fast. That's for sure. That, that, that's well, uh, Matt, can you talk a little bit about Bitwise just in general, like what, what you all do for investors uh, and what options you have available to them? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Bitwise is uh, a crypto asset manager. Crypto is all we do. We emerged into the space in 2017 by creating the world's first crypto index fund. So as I mentioned, I'm, I'm confident in the breakthrough of, uh, of crypto and blockchain. I have less certainty over which asset, which particular asset will win. So we create a, a top 10 index fund that holds the 10 largest crypto assets that you can get exposure to the overall space. And so far we've made that available to accredited investors through a private placement. So uh, if, if you're an accredited investor, you can come into the fund. It has weekly liquidity. It's an easy way to get exposure to the space. We're working to make shares of that top 10 fund tradable on the OTC markets, which means you could buy it through a Schwab account, through a Fidelity account, through a TD account, through any account where you buy stocks or bonds. Uh, and we hope to make that happen later this year. The, the, the last piece, uh, we're also working to, to launch a Bitcoin ETF. Uh, we're making progress. That's a slow effort, but we are making progress. Okay, great. Uh, and then if people want to learn more about some more presentations, because you gave such a, a good one here, if they want some more information, where can they go to find you on the internet? Yeah, that's great. First, come to bitwiseinvestments.com. Uh, you can sign up for our monthly investor letter, uh, which gives our view of what's happening in crypto in the space. You can also find me on Twitter. Uh, Matt underscore Hogan on Twitter. And the other thing I, I like to do, the, the, the thing I like more than anything is answering people's questions. And so either through your financial advisor or directly, uh, feel free to email me if you have questions about the space. It's just matt at bitwiseinvestments.com. 
Uh, we write a lot about the space. We talk a lot about the space. And I'd love to answer your questions if you have them. OK, great. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. And, and this has been a, a fantastic presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Kirk. I, I appreciate you. And I appreciate the people who have been watching. This has been great. OK, well, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Take care.